friends, welcome to another episode of the Ten Laws Podcast with East Forest. I'm East Forest. Uh, this is coming out one day late because the election was yesterday, depending on when you're listening to this, and I'm filming this the day after, and I kind of wanted to see how that went, and I don't know. In some ways, it went a little bit as I expected, but not as I hoped, in that we uh, currently, on this day, November 4th, do not have definitive answers on the presidential race or some other parts of the, the race. And I know that's that's stressful, probably for everybody in different ways. Um, but we did get some good news in Oregon, my home state, where I grew up. They passed Measure 110 and 109, uh, which is to decriminalize small possession of various hard drugs. But what I'm really excited about is 109, which is to uh, legalize the psilocybin for therapeutic use. So it's now the first state in the country to do that. And uh, this is a sign of hope for me. And I hope for all people and that we're seeing that uh, there's the ability to use these as tools and our own communities and, and governments slowly starting to support uh, structures to be able to provide that kind of therapy. So I wanted to have Sarah Gale on the this featured this week. Um, we spoke a bit back and she's from MAPS and we talk about these sorts of subjects among others and I think you'll find it very interesting and I'm really glad she could come on the show. Um, but I just want to encourage you guys to keep in touch with that part of yourselves, that candle flame within that is not blown by any storm. And whatever is happening externally, you can always get in touch with that that part of yourself, that quiescence that is you too. Uh, you, if you want to try using the meditation for chaotic times, that's now on Spotify and Apple, wherever you listen to music, you can use that as a method of tapping into sort of being an eye in the storm. But, uh, you know, look, we're always going to, we don't want to feel like we're going from crisis to crisis as a, you know, as an individual. And you're, and I, I'm going to say that you're not, um, even as the chaos ensues around us in some ways, it always does in different shapes and forms and in different waves of timing for each of us and how those coincide with the greater world and our internal process is unique to each of us, but that's part of incarnation. And you can have that discernment and engagement with the world and still be in touch with that uh, solidity inside you that I'm contending is always there. And I think you know that. I think you know that. So um, the Spores record is is out now, and I'm going to feature a song from that at the end. And I want to thank all of you who showed up for the uh, spatial remix event with Envelope. Thanks to Envelope and Christopher Willits and his team for putting that together for us. That was super fun. I hope to get that mix from him, and maybe I'd be able to share it with you in some other way in a little bit more higher fidelity than they could do on the stream. But I don't know. Stay tuned. And just other housekeeping note is that uh, we're putting out some new merch items uh, in this ensuing days and weeks. Uh, one of them is a Ram Dass print of like the front cover artwork, the painting that Elizabeth Hilton did. And so you can get it in full size, like the painting itself and a 12 by 12 vinyl. So that'll be up at eastforest.org. And we're working on a couple other things, working on a new shirt or sweatshirt. If we can get that done soon, we're trying and um, might be able to get the, sm the smoke blend or herbal smoke blend is going to be back on the eastforest.org merch site soon as well. But you can always get the perfume oils and uh, there's still some spores vinyls and held vinyls and old church vinyls. Held's almost gone. Spores is moving pretty quickly. The old church is on sale, that vinyl. And uh, great holiday gifts. So get on that if you want to get some advanced shopping done for the holidays or to say that you really love someone or you love yourself and you want to, you want to support East Forest. That's always a wonderful way to do that. Thank you for subscribing to the podcast and leaving a review. If you're on a place that you can leave a review like Apple Podcasts, it makes a big difference. Hit subscribe, show your support, share the podcast with your friends on social media and say hello anytime at info at eastforest.org. We appreciate it. Thanks for being a part of the community. All right, let's get into this wonderful conversation with Sarah Gale.
Um, but thank you so much for taking the time to, to join us in this early snowy weather out there in Boulder. Um, I, I, I heard your name bandied about here and there, psychedelic events and so forth. And it's, it's a relatively small community that we're in. And so I'm really just glad we could get a chance to connect in, in person, so to speak, in the virtual space. And uh, I want to start by, um, if you could just give us a very brief introduction. You, you wear a few different hats, and I know you're connected or are connected with the Zendo Project. And I'd like to use that as a launching pad to ask a couple questions. So could you just give us some, just a little background on who you are and what you're up to? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. So I have been working at MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, since around 2013. And the Zendo Project is uh, the harm reduction department's main program at MAPS. And so it is, it is part of MAPS. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, maybe I was confusing it with like dance safe, or is that all the same thing? Different. Uh, so different. Uh huh. Dance Safe is a is a different organization. I also serve on the board of directors at Dance Safe. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Zendo Project has to do with harm reduction in general, right? Uh, Zendo Project focuses specifically on peer support harm reduction. So what the Zendo Project focuses on is providing safe spaces and specialized care um, for people who are having challenging psychedelic experiences. And we work mostly in festival settings, uh, but we also provide education and outreach. Okay. So in the pandemic, you know, things have shifted so much in, in all ways. And in the psychedelic space, you know, some people are still wanting to explore the inner landscape, but trying to figure out ways to do it that feels safe for them. And there's still so many people now who are entering into this space totally virgin and new to the experience and they want to know how to do it safely or, or just, you know, steps that they can take. And I often talk a lot about ceremony and intention and the container in essence and, and music is a big deal for me as a mechanism of, of guiding someone sort of, sort of like a, a digital guide in a way. Um, and you know, what are, but I've also heard people talk about like, Hey, this is not such a great time to be diving into that space, maybe because you don't have the support you think you need or that you might normally have, or, hey, things are really heightened and crazy, and maybe it could just amplify that for you. I mean, what are your takes on using these psychedelic tools now to help us through this? you think that's more harmful or do you think it's more beneficial? Yeah, so we are in such an especially incredibly challenging time right now. And a lot of people, like you, you said, are, are going through a lot emotionally, psychologically. Um, my background is in transpersonal counseling psychology. And that field of psychology really looks at humans embedded within the larger system and framework of society and of, of the universe. And one of the main principles and tenets of transpersonal psychology is that we are impacted and uh, really affected by everything that is going on around us in the world, even if we're not present for something um, physically. And especially right now with everything that's happening in the world, with COVID, um, with uh, protests, um, everything that is going on, you know, I, I really think that we're seeing the the head of things that have been happening for such a long time. So everything's really coming right. to a head. Yeah. And um, it is already in its own way, I think a challenging, it's, it's similar to a challenging psychedelic experience that we're all going through right now right. collectively together. And so I think that there's not really, you know, I don't think that there's a one answer to um, if right now is a worse or better time <laughs> for people to be exploring psychedelics. The reality is people are, are exploring um, just like they have for millennia. <laughs> and um, right now, like you mentioned, because psychedelics are becoming much more, uh, you could say mainstream, they're becoming um, 
I, I believe that psychedelic use is definitely increasing. And the vast, vast majority of psychedelic use happens outside of clinical contexts, uh, therapeutic contexts, and cer- ceremonial contexts, right? So, um, and I think that th- this is a question that we're really talking about right now in uh, psychedelic spaces, and uh, there's a lot of dialogue around how to, um, you know, safe harm reduction practices for people who are choosing to use psychedelics during this time. And I just think it's, you know, harm reduction is all about, it, it's a big field. Harm reduction is a really big field, much bigger than psychedelics, and really focuses on a alternative to prohibitionist models of dealing with substance use. And specifically with psychedelic use, it's really about having honest conversations and dialogues around psychedelics and also uh, helping to mitigate the risks that are associated with psychedelics. So pandemic or not, there are inherent risks associated with psychedelics. And it's really important um, as a society and as a psychedelic movement for us to adequately address the risks associated with psychedelics, especially if we're going to be really speaking about the benefits to which there are, you know, many potential benefits for uh, psychedelics. And so it's important to have a really balanced perspective, right? And in the 60s, that's a lot of what we didn't have. And we didn't have those tools um, for, uh, you know, the same awareness around the risks and, and how to work with those risks. So at the Zendo Project, we really deal with the emotional, you know, challenging experiences that people have when they take psychedelics. And it's it's normal for psychedelics to bring up challenging things. That's why they work mm-hmm. in therapy. That's why they're so beneficial um, in therapeutic settings or in ceremonial settings. Um, one of the reasons is because they bring up things to work with, right? So right now, I think some things for people to be aware of from a harm reduction perspective is just um, set and setting. So being aware that your mindset um, might be really different right now than your normal baseline. So uh, really paying attention to, you know, if you're sp- experiencing depression, anxiety, um, if you f- you're feeling very uh, not in a good place and not grounded and not, um, yeah, not feeling well, I think it's really tempting for people to say, oh, well, I'll just use psychedelics, right? And they're kind of seen as, um, they're kind of sometimes seen as this thing that's just going to fix everything. And it's important for people to recognize, I think, that if you're having a challenging experience and you take psychedelics to try to help yourself, um, that if, if you are not paying attention to set and setting, um, that it could go, uh, you know, it could actually make things worse. So it could, it could exacerbate things. So it's important sure. to just keep in mind that... Um, you know, they're not a panacea, um, that it is really important. And if you, if you choose to take them, um, you know, I really recommend not taking, it's funny right now because everyone's so alone, but, you know, not taking any psychedelic that you haven't taken, especially for the first time alone. Um, if you're taking a, a certain substance for the first time, so if you've taken LSD, but you haven't taken psilocybin, um, you know, I really recommend that you don't take a substance for the first time by yourself. Um, especially in a higher dose. You know, a lot of people go to higher doses. So you want to start off at a lower dose rather than going for that high, you know, heroic dose of something. Um, And ideally you are with somebody who is experienced, who knows the terrain, who is not going to uh, freak out, (laughs) Um, who's going to be able to be a grounded presence for you. Um, so that's one thing, you know, a couple things to consider is just, yeah, we're in really heightened times right now. And it, it's not just going to, you know, taking a psychedelic without paying attention to the safety of your, of your container, of your setting is, is um, not always the best idea. <laughs> yeah, they, they reveal things. And uh, at the end of the day, you're the one making, making changes. Um, I, I think of psychedelics as tools that are particularly adept at times of transition, whether personal transition or they're, they're, they're ways to help lubricate the wheels of, of change. I find like in a sense, they are helping move forward an evolution that is wanting to happen. And often 
in times of depression or in times of dis-ease, there's something that feels a bit stuck or we're needing to accept, in essence, what is growing, emerging, or what wants to die so something new can be born. And these are all natural like, human processes. And so it, it seems quite obvious that what's happening uh, collectively right now is a very big form of that. You know, so many things, as you spoke to correctly, are being revealed and wanting to be shifted and so forth. Uh, and so we need to allow that to happen, but it's very complex and it's very big and it's, it's on the micro and the macro. So in some ways you could say, well, uh, psychedelics could be a, a especially useful tool right now to kind of help usher that process, uh, albeit also with these inherent challenges that you're talking to. So it's sort of like a little bit of a a catch-22, like this whole process we're in, where it is kind of the perfect tool, but it's also, uh, there are some unique challenges uh, in in using them. But I can't help notice that it's kind of ripe. You know, if you if I think, I mean, I, I have my own reservations about it. and But nonetheless, I can see how it could be quite useful. And, uh, and it's sort of like a medicine for the times more than, than, than I've ever seen in a way. Because we need fast change in some ways. Not that fast is better, but at the same time, we're facing some really serious challenges. Uh, and I don't think it's the kind of thing where we can drop this and, and everyone has the experience and everything changes. I don't believe that at all. But for those who feel drawn to it, um, I'm, I agree it's going to happen in different ways. So it's like, how can we give people the tools to have the most positive, safe experience possible? Because they're, they're going to make their own decisions. And so it's sort of providing that information, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there's a lot of resources out there um, that currently exist. I'll provide some resources for your listeners. Um, we have some on our website. Uh, we have a lot of resources on uh, tools for guiding, peer support, uh, basic drug education and harm reduction techniques. And some of the information that we have and the resources that we have are very um, practical and some of them are more philosophical or theoretical. Um, but we have a pretty uh, extensive list of resources, and I'll, I'll point you to some others as well. Um, and one of those resources that we recommend is um, a, a website of integration um, therapists, psychedelic integration therapists. And it's uh, the website is psychedelic.support. And I think that right now, you know, especially in the past, you know, the decade, there's been a huge shift in mental health, and people are starting to really. Um, you know, mental health uh, services and therapy is is much less stigmatized, similar to psychedelics, right? There, there's less mm -hmm. stigma, and there's a there's a lot of therapists out there who work on this this field called psychedelic integration. And if you're considering taking a psychedelic, it can be really helpful to talk to um, a therapist who is friendly to psychedelics, right? Who's an ally. And so this this particular website has a lot of therapists who um, integration work. You know, is is really focusing on helping people integrate after an experience, but many therapists also will talk to people if they if they want to have an experience and just help them. Um, you know, they don't provide guidance or or support during the experience, but they just um, provide some information that might help them yeah. prepare if they're choosing to to have an experience. So I really recommend that that people, um, you know, utilize the the work that's out there because there are so many therapists who are doing this work to support people around psychedelic experiences. Um, and yeah, so it's, if you're not integrating that. in any, in, the more you do that, the more meat you get off the bone because the more it actually becomes something that, that integrates into your waking and walking life for sure. You know, it's funny you say that because anytime I've seen a therapist in my life, I always ask them in my little, like getting to know them, like, have they done psychedelics and sort of like what kind and how deep have they gone? Because I, I remember a quote from Steve Jobs. I just read this in the times and his obituary that he said about his wife that, uh, she had never done LSD and he felt like on a certain level, there were things they could never get to know about each other because they didn't share that sort of landscape of experience. And, it's kind of a dickish Steve Jobsy things, but I also kind of understand what he's trying to say. And I would feel that with a therapist, like in some ways, the experiences that have been had in those spaces 
they're in, ineffable and unexplainable in many ways, yet also deeply inform what it means to be in this world, uh, this more dimensional, three-dimensional world we're in, and trying to make sense of it. Like, I have to use those metaphors and those experiences to understand this too. And without that lexicon to share on any level, I don't, it's just sort of like, I feel like you're, we're, we're cutting ourselves off from the knees and trying to like run a marathon. You know, it's like, I thought we we're here to like really figure out what's going on in the internal psych- psyche and landscape. And so I think it's great that those people are out there. And I know many people are looking for, they want people to help guide them through it more than anything. They're trying to find just the help because they want to feel safe. Right. And I know we're in this tricky spot. How are things in Denver where uh, you're near there um, with this sort of uh, decriminalization and, and, and people in this landscape. Because I know there was also recently, I think it was in Denver, a bust, like a federal bust on some guy who was being a little boastful about growing and selling mushrooms. Um, and I, I don't know if they're trying to send a message federally, but I'm not sure what the landscape is right now of what people are doing there and not doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um- well, to the first thing that you you mentioned there, yeah, I think that that can be absolutely really helpful for you know a therapist to have had their own experiences. There's there's a lot of ways in which people can access altered states. Um, you know, med- some therapists really, you know, psychedelics aren't their thing, and meditation or yoga or, or there's other so many other ways to access those right. states. Um, as part of, so I've been a therapist, um, an investigator in the MAPS MDMA PTSD trials since about 2013. And as part of that work, when you're um, working as an investigator in, in that research study, um, you are have the option, have the opportunity to actually take MDMA in a guided session with two of the trainer therapists. And um, it's part of the, it's part of the training. And so, um, you know, the therapists are given that opportunity so that when they sit with the clients uh, on MDMA, that they have had the experience so they're able to actually hold that space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, to your second point, uh, I do, I live in Boulder and um, I actually, I serve on the board of, uh, so we have a, a Denver psilocybin policy review panel. And so that panel actually reports to the mayor and um, it is a committee and it's made up of uh, people from the city as well as um, harm reduction. I I serve as the harm reduction advocate. Uh, We have um, a therapist on that committee and then we have people uh, from local sheriff's department and um, we have people from the camp, from the city, uh, the city. And so, we are working to create and to help inform some of the policies that are going to be in place around psilocybin. So right now, a lot of things are really being you know, part of the, the intention of this panel is to inform those policies moving forward. So right now, we're kind of in this really gray area situation where we're developing those policies yeah. uh, a- actively um, at, at the panel. And How's so it going? Um, it's going, it's going really well. Yeah. Um, the, the panel is actually the the first kind of the the first kind of this panel that has ever existed, and um, it's really wonderful to be working in collaboration uh, side by side with the um, you know with city officials and having a, a team that is so interdisciplinary of people who have you know more of a psychedelic background have been working in the psychedelic field along with people who are working more on the policy uh, regulation side of things. And so it really is a truly interdisciplinary um, panel. And uh, our report is due next early next year in the spring, and that, that report is going to have recommendations to the city for how to manage uh, and navigate the, the policies. And But one thing that we're working on that I'm really excited about is um, we're actually bringing some of the training, harm reduction training on how to support people during psychedelic experiences. We're, we're bringing that to the city of Denver, um, different uh, multi-responders. like responders. So um, Denver City Paramedics, uh, Law Enforcement, Sheriff's Department, um, 
fire and uh, they have a co-responders unit, a, a, a team of mental health professional social workers who go out on calls with law enforcement when the issue is more of a behavioral or mental health issue. Sure. So we're, at, we're working to help um, train all of those various departments on um, specifically on psilocybin and the, imp- the effects of psilocybin and um, how they can best navigate and deal with the incidents of people who, who are using psilocybin. And they're really, um, the city has been really receptive to uh, this curriculum. And um, after cannabis was, uh, you know, cannab- cannabis um, in, in Colorado, um, after that was decriminalized, it was, uh, they did see some issues, you know, with people who were using cannabis and coming to the city specifically for that, because cannabis is a hell of a drug. <laughs> um, Especially I mean, when you eat be, it. Yeah. Yeah. It can yeah. be incredibly, have, you, yeah. Know, you ever heard effects. the, you ever heard the 911 call of the police officer who calls 911 because he ate too many pop brownies? I did his, hear he that. thinks his wife is dead on the floor and he, he mm-hmm. thinks he's dead and, but he's on the phone and, uh. Yeah, they, they, they confiscated it, apparently. And then mm. he took it, and they made brownies, and then they ate too many, and they went so far. You know, I can picture it. His wife's face down on the floor, just, like, completely in a hole, and he's like, I need to call 911. And mm-hmm. uh, he starts yeah. explaining what happened. And, uh, yeah, perfect but I, harm reduction I, opportunity right there. That's That, that illustrates yes, the importance of harm yes, reduction. Yes, <laughs> yes, and And so are there people in Denver who are openly like guiding journeys or are doing kind of like therapists who are sort of not just doing the integration. Can they legally help people walk through a journey in any way? Um, So there isn't currently a framework in Denver for that. That's a really, uh, you know, it's a different, um, if you look at Oakland, they're doing some work there. Um, Oakland is an example of a city that um, when they passed their initiative, they had much more, you know, every city's initiative is different. So right now there's, uh, you know, decrim in Oakland, in Oregon, in DC. And so as each of these cities and states uh, um, decriminalize certain substances, um, then they're, they're all doing it kind of slightly different. It's similar to when, when cannabis went through the system, right? So um, everyone has a slightly different approach. And the approach in Oakland is definitely more to integrate it and to have um, guides. And I hope that, you know, we can work towards that in in Denver in the future, whether that's having safe spaces for people or looking at, uh, you know, regulations for guiding and things like that. Um, So that's not currently um, the focus of, of our panel, but I think that, you know, in the future, once we get the, the report next year, I think that there'll be opportunities to discuss, you know, how things can be integrated more in, I mean, in the future. What, mm-hmm. What's standing in the way of that right now? Is it just sort of policy making its way through the public system or is it, is it a legality? Cause I know in Oakland, like if they're doing that, they are in a gray area, like, it, they might have decriminalized it in the city, but it's still illegal federally. So do you have any anecdotal uh, stories of how that's going? Or is it just sort of happening and they're trying to keep it like low profile? Well, it was built into the initiative. So when mm-hmm. the initiative passed, um, part of that included a um, section on wanting it to be used for more like therapeutic purposes. Mm. Um, so that was, since it's built in, if something's built into the initiative like that, then immediately when, when the, um, when they're working with the city or with the state, then they're talking about, okay, how do, how can we roll this out in a way that is, um, in a way that is in alignment with the bill that was passed. Right. So in Denver, that wasn't included in the initiative. Yeah, Um, I understand. Yeah. And so here, I think that, um, and yes, you're right. It's still a gray area because of the federal issue. Um, and so a lot of states are just really figuring out, you know, how to navigate that right now. Um, because, you know, especially if you're a licensed uh, therapist, right? Say if you're a licensed therapist and you're wanting to work with um, with a psychedelic, even if it's decriminalized, um, you you're, there's your license, right? So if you're federally, you have a, you hold a license and that has federal guidelines to it. 
So, you know, there's, there's the licensure process of the therapist and then there's, um, getting money, right? So if you get paid, there's, that's a transaction. And so right now psilocybin is decriminalized, but you're not supposed to be selling it, right? Is that supposed to be, um, it's, it's yeah. decriminalized for personal use. It's so. not taxed. I mean, it's, it has mm-hmm. similarities to cannabis. That's also legal federally, but it's, a lot of people aren't in the banking system. That's a whole complicated thing. They work in cash, but I, there's lots of tax. So I, you know, they're, they're working within that system. I'm wondering, cause I know, aren't, do you have mainstream concerns about psilocybin in particular and how it can move into more of a mainstream? If you look at cannabis as an example, and I know there's companies like Compass Pathways and so forth, like how it might go where we have the psilocybin it's going to be sold and taxed and inside now that system where they're trying to like regulate it and make money. What are some of your concerns of uh, how we navigate that process? Yeah. Um, so yeah, right now there's so much conversation happening around, you know, the mainstreaming of psychedelics and commercialization. And I think that it was, there's sort of an inevitability of commercialization of psychedelics and, um, Mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of this catch 22 because I think that it is helpful that psychedelics are becoming more mainstream. Um, you know, people are having experiences, the stigma is, is going down. I think that that's really important, but simultaneously when something becomes popular, when it becomes mainstream, then there's all these concerns, right? So with capitalism and, and, and all this, it's like how to, the capitalistic framework has its flaws and so we're major flaws, right? So we're moving into that space and it's like, how can, how can you move into a space like that while still holding integrity and ethics? And that's a lot of what um, MAPS is really focused on right now. And there's other organizations who are also really focused on this. Um, There's a a project called North Star um, that is yeah. really focused on, uh, yeah, Liana um, at MAPS um, is is one of the founders of that project. And they're really looking at exactly the question you're asking. So how do we bring in um, psychedelics into the mainstream and do it in an ethical way? And so there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of gui- guidelines and obviously, you know, there's, there's different people and different organizations having this conversation. Um, but North Star, I think is a really good example of an organization that's really putting out a lot of content on, um, ethics and what it looks like to bring psychedelics into the mainstream, into, um, uh, you know, into society in an ethical way. And, um, so that's really, you know, some major points are, you know, it's, it's really, I think it's really important to honor that there's been a lot of people doing this work for a really long time. And, you know, there's a lot of people who are coming into the the field and, um, you know, they see the opportunity. And I think that, you know, whether that's investors, um, or new companies, and I think some of the risk is really, uh, not honoring the roots, you know, if we don't honor the roots of where something came from, um, if we don't, and it's, it's not just about, it's, it's, those roots run much deeper than the West. Right. So I think that, um, even mainstream, even psychedelic use in the West is sort of cut off often from the roots of psychedelic use. Right. So there's centuries and centuries of indigenous practice of certain medicines. And yes, we have these new substances that are, um, that are synthetic and, um, but I think it's really important to honor that the psychedelic experience is something that people have been having, you know, for thousands of years. So when that comes to this new, um, you know, commercialization and mainstreaming of psychedelics, I think one of the major risks is losing that connection to, um, to the history of psychedelics, to sort of the major people who have been working in the field, making sure that those people who, have, who were the pioneers, who've been working at this for decades, right, um, that they are, uh, part of the conversation because they have the knowledge and they have the experience. So I think one of the dangers is people who are newer to this field coming in without having that sort of, uh, you know, memory, that collective memory of the movement. And what comes as part of that memory are, uh, 
part of that memory is how to use psychedelics in safe ways, how to be ethical around the use of, of these medicines. Um, you know, awareness of some of the issues that can come up in the psychedelic field, um, both on the personal level as well as on the community level. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of ethical and issues to navigate with psychedelics because there's such um, there's such powerful tools, and or especially around the use of psychedelics in therapy and the use of psychedelics uh, as a guide. Um, you know, it's really ethical issues are really front and center. We have to be really, really no mindful doubt. because there's such a power dynamic already in a, a therapist client relationship. And so that, you know, that needs to be attended to. And then, yeah, I just think that accessibility is another huge um, ethical issue. You know, how can we make these, uh, these medicines available for everyone? Um, and that's a huge issue in mental health care right now in general. And that's one that I think the psychedelic field is really is already facing and is going to need to face is how do we um, how do we make these these substances available for those, yeah. especially for those who who need it the most. And that's that's one of the biggest issues of, of capitalism, right? The people who are left behind um, and who aren't able to benefit from um, advances in, in yes. uh, things like mental health. Yeah, I c- couldn't agree more um, that I believe the, the leading edge of the psychedelic wave uh, beyond the legality issue, which I think it's a lot of the attention, is how do we make the medicines uh, relevant to the people who uh, you don't see? And that's mostly BIPOC people. When you go to the conferences or you go to any any kind of underground event, it's it's largely people who who uh, are generally white and have money and a lot of men too. And, um, and so I think we, we can pick apart some of the obvious reasons why that is. Um, I think it's, it's more about opportunity and cultural relevancy of, of, you know, a lot of times when you get into spiritual things like this, it's, it comes often from an affluence. Like you have the time, you have the ability to explore this stuff. Uh, just, I mean, on the most basic level, but I think it's a really difficult and important question to, to start working on. And I know there's a lot of wonderful people working on this now, and it's also partially a byproduct of the Black Lives Matter movement is how the psychedelic medicine fits into that model as part of all of this. Because we talked originally about how they're great for tools of transition and change. Well, now there's a big one and healing and working with trauma. And it's like, and these things are really, really sticky and tricky, but these are really, really, really powerful medicines. Um, so what, what have you been finding are ways that we can make it relevant to people who uh, don't have access, haven't had access, people of color who not only maybe are they less represented in, in that world, but there's also some skepticism. Culturally, it's been there too, because of things that have happened from our own governments with uh, v- psychedelics actually, <laughs> and, and vaccines and all, these are real things that happened in the past. Um, how do we overcome that? How do we make it more relevant? How do we make this work for everybody? And I, I know this is like a question that I don't expect there to be an easy answer to, but it's just something to explore. What have you been thinking about? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the most, or one of the most important things that, that I've been thinking about, and that is one of the major focuses at MAPS is asking that exact question uh, to BIPOC communities, right? So um, bringing people, uh, inviting everyone to the table for that conversation, right? So that it's not just, um, so that we don't uh, adapt uh, the white savior complex and, you know, that, um, that people aren't coming in trying to figure out what is good for these communities, but that the communities are being asked themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So part of that really involves um, uh, centering and uplifting the voices of BIPOC in the psychedelic community, of which there are many. And um, so part of what we've been really doing with MAPS and with the Zendo Project is bringing in uh, people in who work in the field of, uh, you know, specifically with Zendo Project, people who work in the field of harm reduction, um, and who have created uh, different organizations that are doing harm reduction work, 
and um, helping to bring awareness to those organizations that exist, um, helping to funnel and generate funds, uh, maybe through fiscal sponsorship, right? So more like bigger organizations that um, can generate funds as well as um, the marketing for these different organizations. So um, we also have a lot of, um, we've been having, you know, more conversations um, on webinars. So bringing in people, um, you know, who are talking about BIPOC issues in psychedelic spaces and bringing them in on our webinars, on our talks, um, on our uh, panels, you know, so more representation at conferences, more representation. Um, I, I know we're not doing like live conferences right now, but in a lot of focus really um, right now on bringing in those voices to answer, you know, that exact question, as well as to really just um, uplift and, and center those organizations and those sure. people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, some of it's an economic issue. Let's just talk about accessibility, because I think if you look at the medicalization model, one concern is that it'd be really, it could be really expensive. And our, our medical model in general is crazy expensive. So it's like, well, how do we make this available to people who don't have any money or not a lot of money? Or um, are, are you more in sort of the decriminalization sort of sort of like, look, let people make their own decisions and, and it's sort of the freedom of that? Or do you, are you, I know MAPS is a little bit more in the medical model typically of let's regulate, let's go through the system, make it work and, and do, it, do it in a particular way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I am, I'm a fan of whatever gets us there and multiple, uh, multiple directions. Um, and when I say whatever gets us there, I don't mean whatever, but I mean the, the intelligent ways to get us there. <laughs> um, obviously that I, I you thought know. you meant guns, guns. And, 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. so, um, yeah, ends definitely don't justify, uh, means. So, um, you know, I, I think that so I'm working in harm. I, I kind of have uh, work that I'm doing in harm reduction, in the medicalization, and uh, in decriminalization. Right. So I'm, I'm working in all right. three of those realms, and uh, I think that it's important that those the people in those different um, sectors that they work together, and that we um, work, you know, collaboratively, knowing that we're all trying to achieve the same goal. And I think that decriminalization is going to be able to do certain things quicker and. Um, different, it's going to be different and medicalization and, um, you know, harm reduction kind of just holds it all. Harm reduction is, is kind of this, like in general, how do we help create more safety in the psychedelic experience, whether it's, uh, you know, therapy or, um, yeah, people yeah. You know, using it in a home. So, um, yeah, I think that, um, this question is question of accessibility. I think that we're going to see, um, that different organizations and different people are going to have um, unique approaches. So there are going, there's likely going to be, you know, um, more expensive retreat centers in the future where people who sure. choose to go and do that will do that. And then there will be, and there already are organizations that are popping up that are focused on, you know, the nonprofit model or possibly the public benefit model. And um, with a focus on creating things like scholarships and, um, you know, having, having money that is specifically put aside that donors, um, they can fundraise for that donors are specifically focused on, you know, providing um, money for, for that specific um, cause, right, to help uh, address the accessibility issue. Um, and so I think that um, the, one of the big things in the future will be insurance, right? Like how do we work with insurance? And that's one thing that the medicalization, uh, yeah, in general, model that's a big problem. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's funny cause we're like, we're simultaneously talking about like right now, the mental health system, just like the medical health system in the U S is just so, so messed broken. up. We're so broken. And so it's like psychedelics are both coming into this system and, and, and it's like, okay, how do we play with this system? How do we play well with the existing but that, systems that exist? While well, also being it's, like, we need to reform these systems. And I think psychedelics are reforming these. I mean, that's what psychedelics are, are doing is they are, there is the opportunity here for major system reform. Um, but when you're, when you come in and you want to reform a system, you know, you're going to run up against so many different obstacles. Yeah. 
it could be mm-hmm. argued that, you know, we're trying to fit into a system that's like a sinking ship. It's like, it's such as lumbering FDA. The whole thing is just like impossible. I mean, you know, what's a psychedelic precondition? And you know, we get into these sorts of crazy ideas. And I mean, I don't know. I, I totally hear you and I'm not advocating one or the other because I honestly don't know, but I would, this idea, it was smart of like decriminalizing on a municipal level because it's like, yeah, that seems like you could get that done as opposed to like, okay, let's work at the federal level with, you know, 380 million people. I mean, good luck. I mean, God, I mean, just look at the cannabis movement, how that just kind of organically kept going and going and going. And we're still at this place of like, it's pretty much publicly accepted. There's been no real issues. It's making a lot of money for a lot of people in states and it's still illegal federally. You know, it's like, it doesn't even make sense. You know, still putting people in jail for that. And there's still people in jail for that. And so you look at things like that are schedule one uh, with psilocybin and other psychedelics and, yeah, I look at the ketamine model a little bit where that's really burgeoning and um, I've had a little bit of experience in that lately because my partner has been uh, working for a clinic here in Boise, Idaho and uh, leading like group sessions. And I, so I'm sort of now just paying attention to that uh, ecosystem more. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of this ethical backbone of, it really feels like a gold rush. Um, I feel like I I introduced the North Star Pledge actually to this place. It says, you know, I think this would be a great thing, not just because it's effective because it's, or like if it's a badge you can wear to say like, hey, we do, this is our North Star for people out there looking for where to, to get their ketamine therapy. Because there are some places where you pretty much just can pay, you go in and they just, there's no therapy. They're just shooting you with the medicine and I, it can be incredibly powerful. I mean, talk about harm reduction. There, there really isn't any. It's just sort of like, oh, it won't kill you and it, it hopefully will make you less depressed. So here you go. And it's like, hold up here. This is just a small slice of the pie. A large piece of it is that processing, that integration, the preparation, the sort of how do I walk through these spaces that baffle the conscious mind? Um, so as the ketamine, the way that's coming in is at the four, because it was already scheduled differently. So it didn't have to switch and it sort of came through the back door in a sense. And now it's really like there's a lot of money coming up in that, you know, these $1,200 sessions in LA and stuff and uh, even ads on Instagram and virtual sessions. Uh, and I'm not saying bad or good, but this is, you're seeing it happen. The American model of like, okay, let's, let's go for it. Um, what are you seeing in that as sort of an analogy that might you might we might see or not see with things like psilocybin? Yeah, um, yeah, ketamine is definitely um, an interesting case. You know, it's such an intense experience in the higher doses. It's really important oh to um, yeah. be working with with skilled people. And I think with this, it's like education is key because um, you know people are going to be uh, you know, the, the growth of the growth can sometimes happen quicker than regulation. Right. So people are going to be doing all kinds of things. And when, when we saw, um, so when I saw ketamine, gosh, I guess a decade ago, kind of saw like a future trajectory. And then I I started, um, offering ketamine therapy at a clinic here in Boulder, a number a few years ago, maybe five years ago. And, um, when we started doing ketamine assisted therapy, we were looking around the space and this was before the, the big sort of boom happened yeah. and that we were concerned, right? Cause we saw this and it was just like, Oh, this is, we really need to integrate more therapy. And there were people who were, were doing ketamine therapy. Absolutely. And now, um, you know, so, so I did that for a couple of years and now we see a lot more ketamine therapists. And so that is one move in the right direction is, is ketamine therapy, right? Like, Work, working with therapists who actually have an experience, have experience doing, you know, psychedelic therapy. And um, in a lot of, of cities right now, um, you can find people who, whereas like, you know, even five years ago, it was much more just the clinic model. So I think the more that we educate people that there, there's two main things that exist. There's like infusions and then there's therapy. 
And if people are going right. for mental health purposes, for emotional and psychological health purposes, that they, sh- that they really consider educating themselves and becoming, um, you know, going to a, a therapy uh, center instead of a, a, just an infusion center. Um, and so that's, that's one thing. And, um, you know, and then amongst ketamine therapy, you know, being really aware, learning about the therapist. So how long have they been practicing? What are their background? What's their education background? What's their experience in the psychedelic field? Right. Um, because they're, you know, I, I think that it's, it, there's a lot of learning going on right now. And I think it's really important that, you know, therapists don't just like, I think it as uh, for an ethical integrity note for therapists, like before you start doing ketamine therapy, like really get the training, right? There's, there are ketamine therapy training programs out there that are good. And so research those programs, learn about the people who have been working with ketamine for years, you know, for decades, because those people do exist. And so mm-hmm. like seek out training from those, from those people. And I, I think that that, to your question, that really um, is, is the same for as, as other psychedelics start to become more available. Those rules can be applied to that as well. Yeah, I, I, I'm i torn because here I am saying these things and then I hear you say what I'm saying back about like, well, there's not much regulation. Then part of me is like, regulation. <laughs> but then I'm like, wait a minute, maybe, but maybe that's the problem. And it's like, ah, oh, it's so tough because I, I, in my heart, I feel like, but what I want is the freedom for people to decide and do what they need to do and they make the decisions. So you saying it's sort of about re-education and education and tools because there are always going to be, I would hope, many options. And you just want people to have the freedom and the ability to enter into the one that they feel is really works best for them. And they're doing that with their eyes wide open. So that could be like the barrier is not economic, right? And maybe you're in a place where uh, this is not even something, an avenue you've considered, but it's like, I, I have a way in and I don't have to worry about the money part. And I feel like I know now like the dangers versus just sort of like, stumbling across an Instagram ad. And I don't know. I mean, I, I had, I had a particularly crazy experience with ketamine and that's why it really opened my eyes to like the power of, of -hmm. that medicine and what people are really actually doing. You know, it's not just getting an infusion. Like that's like, this is, this is psychedelic soul work at the deepest level of your psyche potentially. And so accepting Mm -hmm. that potentiality is a Mm -hmm. big responsibility uh, and I think we yeah. need to acknowledge that and acknowledge that this kind of therapy, uh, as you know, uh, is very much about uh, beyond the chemical reactions. It's, it's about that deep psychological, I'm just going to call it soul work. I mean, that kind of is the real power and, and, and juice of it. And so we can't, we, not working with that, acknowledging that in some ways, putting that at the top of the altar uh, it does a disservice and denying like what you're really there to do and maybe, you know, why you came into this space, whether you knew it or not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's speak a little bit to regulation because you're bringing up an important point. You know, I think, uh, in America, in the U.S., right? We regulation. Taxes. We don't like we don't like to be regulated. But let, let's talk about this as an analogy um, that I, I like to use is, is is driving, right? So let's pretend that so psychedelics are vehicles. They help us get somewhere, right? Uh, where is that place? place? Where where are we going? Well, that's different. It's, different. it's different. It's different for everyone. Um, and so. And there, we could pretend that all the psychedelics are maybe different kinds of cars, right? Like buses and, and small cars and, you know, the, so different psychedelic substances are all of these cars. And, um, you know, decriminalization or medicalization or, or access, um, increasing access is making it more, making cars more available for people to get, get somewhere, right? Making these vehicles more available for people to to get somewhere. So I think the education piece is important. If you think about when you learn to drive, you've got education on how to drive, right? You, you didn't just go and get in your car and just go out there, right? So, so that was really important. So education around the different substances, where they might take you, where you might want to go, right? Setting intentions of where do you want to go with this? Where do you not want to go, right? Um, when you get in a car, it's, it's generally good to know where you're going. Um, 
And then, um, and then education is also like a map, you know, it's like, what is the territory? What is known about the territory? Um, based on so many people's past experiences, what can, you know, the, the um, experiences and the wisdom and knowledge of people who have been there before tell you and, you know, create a, you have a map oh, now. I just use GPS. It's all good. Like <laughs> or I, GPS, I right? But, yeah. <laughs> but what is GPS, right? It's like, <laughs> There's probably an analogy for that. So, um, and then there's there's regulation, right? So we have at least here in the U.S. And I mean, I've traveled to other countries that maybe don't have the same system of regulation of traffic as we do here. But in the U.S., if you just um, set people loose and you're like, okay, you're 16, you can drive a car, but you don't teach them anything about you know the regulations of the road, the traffic signs, the stop signs the, you know, what to do with other cars, how to navigate all of these things, the speed limit, right? It would just be crazy. So to me, it's like, that's what regulation is, is it's helping provide some, some boundaries and some safety. And when you're in a culture that has been so, I mean, we've been suppressed on, on so many levels, but when it comes to psychedelics and the suppression of consciousness and the suppression of like freedom of thought and cognitive liberty and being able to like go where we want to go, I think that it's actually really dangerous to just set people loose on the road without any regulation. So I think that those regulations um, that can be established, and those are informed res- regulations that are informed by the psychedelic field and by people who've been in the community for many years. They're not just regulations that are just like top-down regulations from the government that's like, this is how you should okay. use psilocybin. You know? So I'm, I'm a big fan of <laughs> regulation well, let me, let me... and education. <laughs> I I hear that. And for the sake of discussion, let me push back and say this. Now, you could argue in that same analogy that driving is not argue. Driving is a privilege. It is not a right. We we have to. Uh, that's what it says in the law. Whereas things like owning a gun is a right um, to vote is your right. It can be taken away from you. It's based on your age. It would make sense to me that your cognitive liberty and your ability to control your consciousness is your right. It is not a privilege that I need to be given by any authority to tell me how to do it. And so we're inside now a system where it gets a little tricky from sort of an ethical level about, yes, I, I do agree. I actually think it would make a lot of sense to get a license for a gun. Shouldn't I need to know how to use it a little bit before I can go buy one? But in fact, in this country, you can walk into a store if you have uh, uh, some ID you walk out with a gun. That's it. No one asks you anything about how to use it, what to do with it, where to store it, nothing. Because they've, we've built that into our constitution uh, for whatever you think about that. And so you bring that into the psychedelic space and it's like, what if I want to, I want to believe that that is my right, especially if it's not hurting anybody. It's not even like a gun uh, to, to, to take a substance that's growing out of the ground, like a mushroom and or a, a marijuana plant and to smoke it. That's my decision on my own private time in my own home. But uh, we're working through a system where we want to have regulations. And I know the intent, I agree with the intent to make it safer and in information and education. But there is that balance, if you think about it that way, where it's like, it's a slippery slope than to say like, you can do it, you can't do it. This is how you do it. This is how you pay for it. And this is who you pay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think... Um... I mean, you're kind of pointing to that accessibility piece, which is like not everyone can afford a car, um, there you right? Go. Oh, yeah. so, so that's the, that's one set of issues that's being addressed, and then the other one is, you know, that I hear you speaking to is is this this piece around um, it is taking a substance versus your behavior, right? So I think in in general that um, laws around substances, all substance use, like let's let's get out of the psychedelic box for just one second. I know we're talking about psychedelics today, but um, behavior, we don't have to, but right? how, how, how is your, if your, if your substance use, your psychedelic use, um, is having behavioral issues that are causing harm to people around you or that are potentially causing harm to people around you, right? Shouldn't be driving when you're on a psychedelic. You, you shouldn't, you know, there's, there should be, there should be regulation around behavior as it oh, relates yeah, to psychedelics. Of course. Absolutely. And that's, you know, and, and that exists obviously for everything, yeah. like yes. all, all behavior in general, we have laws. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But I think that um, for drugs specifically, you know, we've been so, because they've been stigmatized for so long and criminalized for so long, I think that um, we're moving out of that old paradigm where uh, 
when we talk about drug use, um, you know, and we talk about things like addiction in this society, it is very much like a um, drug use is bad, not like let's focus on behaviors that people are doing and let's focus on on making sure that people are, um, you know, safe and that others around them are safe. I think that's where we need to put our focus. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's been some success with that in other countries in certain ways, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, when you, it's the American mindset and model is so unique. Uh, I mean, whether you look at our coronavirus response or anything, guns, you know, uh, drugs in a lot of ways, we're the leader on that. But um, we, we have uh, an irony of our cognitive obstinance of liberty, yet we then don't follow through on that by just allowing that liberty. You know, it's like, I don't know, it's a weird fear there, almost like an adolescent growth nodal point. We can't seem to like break through where it's like, but that's the thing you say you want and that you stand on, but then you, those are the people who won't let it happen. And uh, it's a growing pain. It's a big one, but boy, are we in a time of, of growth and change. And uh, I know that you guys have been, and, and you're right in the middle of it and have been for a long time. So uh, I do appreciate you diving into this this space and, and filling us in like where the the leading edge is on everything and uh, and and being game to uh, play along with some of my my uh, devil's advocate. I'm not really I'm actually quite an optimist about it <laughs> like, but I just for the I think it makes a better conversation if we kind of try to explore the like different viewpoints. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's really important because it, it's the conversation that's happening right now. You know, this, the psychedelic community isn't one unified field of everyone kind of being no, on the no. same page. It's a lot of disagreement. There's a lot of conflict. And, um, you know, I think if psychedelics teach us, I mean, psychedelics can teach us many things, but one thing that they can teach us is um, how to work together and that we are all connected um, to you know, one reality and one, or I don't say one reality, there's many multiple realities, but we're all connected. And that, um, you know, I really hope it's my hope that, um, that some of those conflicts and disagreements that are happening within the field, that the field can, can work to navigate some of those conflicts. Because I think that, um, I think that the psychedelic experience does inform us on how to navigate difficult trans, uh, interpersonal issues. Yeah. yeah. So th- thank yeah. you for, for bringing that because it's important. Yeah. And this is how we do it. Um, and that's kind of been one of my main goals with this is to the part of that education, so to speak, is having these conversations, voicing some of these ideas, giving people opportunities to voice their ideas and explore it. And it's an ongoing conversation and evolution. So thanks for being a part of it. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thank you, Sarah. Really appreciate you coming on. Um, And I love the timing with this new initiative in Oregon that had a resounding pass, a resounding success. So that is a wonderful sign. This song you're hearing in the background is called Passage, and it is from the album Spores, which uh, is now available on digital and vinyl wherever you listen to music. And the vinyl is available at eastforest.org, along with all the other merch items. Listen, guys, uh, interesting week ahead, and (laughs) keep your head high. Just remember to get outside, keep breathing. Remember to to get in touch with the things that are actually right around you, like your communities and your families and your friends and your loved ones and yourself and nature and all the beings that surround us uh, and this web of life and this incarnation that we are in. Keep walking your walk, friends. Don't take any shit, but if you do, do it with grace. Grace.